basis of trust, how trust is developed is the person feels that there's someone looking out for my well-being. And that's a felt sense. When someone feels, and if you think about all the relationships in your life, when you honestly feel that someone's looking out for your well-being, you begin to see them more and then you trust the relationship more. The person is more able to be receptive to learning. And a felt sense, trust is crucial for child development and crucial for any relationship. So you are the thermostat and we are the tools. And I'm always aware of my energy. And we're gonna talk about being aware of your own self in the relationship. You are the tool. I believe being a good clinician and having impact on any person, any human being, it starts with you and relationship comes first. So you being the thermostat, we want to maintain that positive, effective tone that influences rather than letting their negative tone influence you, which happens all the time. I'm a mother. I was just getting my son ready for school and his tone then impressed my tone and I had to take a few deep breaths. This takes a lot of practice, a lot of self-awareness, a lot of slowing down your own nervous system so that we're not picking up other people's nervous system, then acting it out having counter-transference, being annoyed, frustrated, overwhelmed, and then projecting that back. And especially children who've experienced trauma or anything overwhelming or scary in any relationship, they're going to project that on any future relationship. Are you gonna do the same? So as clinicians, we do need to be aware of how we're being impacted. Because if we react to their negative emotional states, then from the child's point of view, I will feel powerful and in control. By remaining calm time and time again, I will eventually see you as strong enough to deal with me and my pain, and I will stop testing you. Trust me. So kids are going to test. Are you going to do the same? So they're going to push our buttons. We need to accept that. Children who've experienced trauma will push our buttons. We need to accept that. A caregiver who yells, child will perceive that caregiver as a threat or a possible stress of rejection. Convey information in a storytelling mode. Try getting below eye level in a relaxed posture. Have empathy and say, I'm right here with you. There's new science that getting below eye level actually impacts and activates the adaptive neural network, that prefrontal cortex, the thinking, problem solving, thinking for themselves builds the executive function of the brain. Think about that. When we have typical traditional parenting where it's the parent here talking to the child down here in a threatening, it's my way or the highway, you're gonna do this because I said so. The child then learns to obey in fear and obey as opposed to listen, be receptive and unfearful. In building relationship with children who've experienced trauma, we actually wanna get below and help them build their brain to have the capacity to think problem solve so that they can grow and then we can grow with them. So it's not one up, one down. It's helping the child grow this compromised, vulnerable, overwhelmed, disorganized brain that they can't even manage for themselves. So we need to help manage, create these adaptive neural networks. So it takes a lot of adjustment. And when we do these trainings, it, it's a big adjustment for clinicians, for caregivers to go, oh, okay, I need to do this differently. And you'll begin to see change. So trust this process too. I really, really encourage you to trust this process. I use all these applications with all my clients and my own family, and I see it working. So it doesn't just work with 
uh, populations who've experienced trauma. It works with everybody. It will help all of us slow down and get out of reactivity and get into responsibility with each other. So to support transitions, transitions are big for this population. Let them know the beginning, middle, and end of what's going to happen. There are attitudes that I use that come from attachment-focused parenting, which is place. Playful, loving, accepting, curious, empathic. These are attitudes that you accept, that you understand, and will convey for the client, for the child, for the parent you're working with, and I say for yourself too. So you're going to apply them to those you're working with and also go inside and apply them to you. 75% of the time, ask open-ended questions. So avoid saying to an idea, it doesn't matter or I don't care. Because remember that rejection part of the brain. They're then going to feel, can I trust this relationship because you really don't care? A lot of these kids, and I talked about it in the first session about shame, they take things very personally because they feel like they're all bad. So phrasing, be careful of what we're saying. It doesn't matter can be transferred into, I don't matter. I don't care can be interpreted as, I don't care about you. So just be aware of phrases to avoid blaming, shaming, and becoming defensive in your stance or creating that defensiveness in the child and family as you're working with. Avoid black and white thinking, which is always, never, should, why. Take them out of the vocabulary. Why are you doing that? Most of the time, these kids aren't aware and don't know why they're doing it. And it actually makes them more self-analyzing and more self-critical and more defensive because they don't have the answers. And kids naturally want to gain the approval of those around them. It, it takes time for children, again, to develop relationship, especially when the attachment figure relationship that they had previous was threatened. It is very, it takes a long time and it's hard for families if they're not coached in attachment parenting and trauma-informed parenting to know that the way that they're addressing or communicating to their children is actually causing more separation, more division, more defensiveness, where you have just two, the child and the parent just both flipping their lids on a daily basis. When they can just shift and reframe their thinking around this way to build safety and trust relationship, they will see a shift. I like to say, say and, not but, because but implies conflict. And these are just little pieces just to think about. <laughs> There's no perfect here. It's just being aware. Um, who Louise Hayes had a wonderful, and I highly recommend you listen to one of her lectures called The Power of Your Spoken Word. When I heard this lecture, it helped me become more aware as a clinician, as a parent, as a friend. So part of healing is understanding what's happened to you, not what's wrong with you, and understand how to make sense of it, and then be able to begin to trust, show some vulnerability, apply the coping skills that you've been taught, and utilize them. And in exchange, internalize a sense of self-worth, self-esteem. And when you feel good, you want to do good. And when you do good, you feel good. It's just that beautiful yin yang of healing and making a difference in your own life. So a child in stress reads our bodies before they can attune to our words. 95% of communication is nonverbal. So we wanna memorize the seven nonverbal cues. And eye contact, the way you're looking at the child. Facial expressions, how you're holding your face. I highly recommend just going to the mirror and asking a question, like thinking of one of your kids and see how you appear when you're asking a question. Like, 
tell me what's happening right now and see if you're coming across as a source of safety or a source of distress. Because remember, you are the tool here, tone of voice. And remember the tone of voice, you wanna be in a curious stance, curious tone of voice, as opposed to an interrogating, questioning, I need to know the answer now, what's happening? Which is more about your own response activated stress system as opposed to what's actually happening. So tone of voice is curiosity, posture, how you're holding your body, how you're holding your hands. Are you in a clenched fist? Are you moving too fast? Are your hand gestures pointing? Pointing is going to create a defensive stance. Uh, I had a teenager who she said pointing if you point at somebody, you can see there's always three fingers pointing back at yourself. And I tell kids, when you point at somebody, even teens, there are always three fingers pointing back at yourself. What's within you that whatever's happening around you is triggering for you? And what can you take responsibility for? So what's triggering you? What can you take responsibility for? And what can you do differently? in this situation, one, two, three. That's a great little intervention when we point a finger at someone else. We're also, we need to take responsibility for ourselves. And then six, timing and intensity of response, six and seven. So the timing of response, how fast or slow and the intensity of the response. We don't recognize that sometimes we're very intense, like, oh, why did that happen? Or why did that? It's the more we can slow down and not go in reactive mode, because that's exactly what these kids want us to do. They just want to hook us and make us reactive because it's what's familiar for them. It's what's their homeostasis. And what we want to do is create a new relationship in a new ex and a new experience in the world that life doesn't have to be so fast and scary and overwhelming and intense all the time. And I think most of you know, I come from this experience. I was always waiting for the shoe to drop. I was always waiting for the rug to be pulled out from under me because it was pulled out many times. I didn't know what was going to happen. I kept asking my mother who adopted me after seven and a half and I'd been with her for a few years. I kept asking her, when are you going to give me away? When are you going to give me away? And I was shocked when my mother told me this as an adult. And I said, wow, I truly did not believe that I was staying there. Even though I knew it was an adoption logically, I didn't feel the security and stability in my own body. So I always felt like something was just going to happen again. The intensity of life was so intense. And I was always trying to find a sense of <sighs> relief, but I couldn't find it within my own body. So a lot of the interventions we're going to talk about today are helping kids from a bottom up utilizing their body to get their bodies in a state of <sighs> relief so they can begin to think about the world as a source of relief and not a source of distress. So OWL, observe, watch, and listen to the client's seven nonverbal cues and be aware of your own. So the importance of connection. Trauma-informed practice is about we. We are going to figure this out together. Focus on the problem. Children need your connection first, not correction. Lectures are not effective because they actually educate the child to comply with the authority rather than to develop their own meaning about the issue. It's like giving a prosecuting attorney more information to work with. And I'm sure there's a lot of people nodding their heads. These kids are smart. They are survivors. They are listening to every piece <laughs> of what you're communicating to them. And when they test you is when they don't trust you. So we want to be very clear in our communication. So keeping it short and sweet, 
I want you to, I need you to accept responsibility for initiating repair with me when we've had a blow up. That's the child's point of view. Now, here's what happened. When kids act out and may maybe have done something pretty horrendous, overwhelming to the caregiver, to the clinician, we tend to, it's overwhelming, right? We, we, it impacts us. It can trigger us. We can blow up. They blow up. But what happens is, the tendency is now I need them to apologize before we can continue in this relationship. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If we wait for them to apologize, it's going to take years. And I tell this to parents all the time. And this is where parents have to get out of their ego and focus not on the solution, not on the problem, but on the child. We have to work on the relationship because if the parent insists that the child apologize first, then you are communicating that I'm responsible for the continuity of the relationship. I, the child, will then think the relationship is not important to you and it will be highly unlikely that I will have the confidence to take the first step which will lead to a downward spiral of negative distancing and possibly take forever. Or if I do initiate repair, I'm going to experience resentment that I had to be the good one and be sorry before my caretaker would welcome me back again into their mind and heart. When I learned about attachment focused parenting and I said, wow, that's how I was parented. It didn't help me. It didn't help the relationship. And it does cause resentment from the child to the caregiver because caregivers need to step back and go, I'm going to model. Wow, we had a really hard time this morning and I also blew my top and I'm going to take responsibility for my part because I know when I get angry or big and yell, it's scary for you. And I don't want to do that for you or for us. So, so modeling is so impactful. And when you begin to fill that child's cup with modeling, they'll begin to internalize, oh, then they're going to look at that care caregiver and be able to communicate also, I'm sorry that I, I got really mad too and I didn't know what to do. Yeah, we're going to figure this out because because now I don't have my cell phone because I threw it against the wall. Yeah, because that's a natural consequence. What are we going to do about this? Now we don't have a cell phone or now we don't have the iPad. We have empathy for the problem. What are we going to do about that now that this happened? So again, it's not going to the standpoint of what's wrong with you. It's wow, look at what happened to us. And let's figure this out together.